and welcome to the third presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom, and today I am both the host and the speaker. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Oregon and have a research focus in language documentation and preservation in East Africa, and also the development of language documentation methods more generally. Uh, today I'm going to talk for a little over 30 minutes, and if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to uh, type those into the chat module of Zoom, and I will uh, do my best to answer any questions uh, after I'm done speaking. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about linguistic diversity among the Datoga. And the first thing I want to say is that the, the sociolinguistic context in which Datoga varieties are spoken, I think it, it makes for a unique opportunity to explore many different aspects of language variation. Uh, today, I'm largely going to restrict my discussion to questions of linguistic diversity across and within the traditional Datoga subgroups, which are called Emojiga. And specifically, I want to highlight three issues that we face in understanding language diversity among these groups. And the first issue is that uh, there's an unknown geographic distribution of these traditional ethnic subgroups. So we don't actually know where all Datoga speakers are within Tanzania. Uh, second, uh, we don't actually know which geographic and ethnic uh, subcommunities correspond to distinct language communities. So there's been a traditional assumption that the, um, that this, the Emojiga subgroups correspond to distinct language groups, but that hasn't actually been verified. Uh, then finally, the, the third issue that we face in understanding language diversity is that even for the language communities that we know are distinct from each other, there's unknown variation across and within those communities. Um, so even within a given uh, Emojiga subgroup, uh, there's uh, different geographic groups and there might actually be variation between those and that has uh, yet to be explored. So first, uh, just introducing the Datoga, who are they? Well, they're a traditionally semi-nomadic pastoralist ethnic group or macro group uh, residing in Tanzania. And they generally can be said to be shifting to a settled agro-pastoral lifestyle. Uh, there are a number of names that have been given to the Datoga, as you can see here listed on the screen. Uh, in Swahili, they're oftentimes referred to as Wataturu or Wamangati. Uh, there's no accurate census data for the Datoga. We, we don't actually know how many of them there are, although it is commonly estimated that uh, today there are between 100 and 200,000 uh, members. Um, also, uh, Datoga, either as an individual language or as a language cluster, has been uh, described as a member of the Southern Nilotic uh, language family. So, in, in answering or beginning to answer the, the first uh, question that I, I posed as an issue in our understanding of language diversity, what is the geographic distribution of the Datoga? Uh, well, originally the Datoga were located in Kenya. It was backed up by oral history that was collected by Tomikawa and uh, Wilson, as well as a number of uh, reconstructions uh, done by Eret. And uh, according to Wilson in his 1952 report during his field work when he was in East Africa, um, he reports that there actually were Datoga speakers still located in Kenya. Uh, generally today, it's assumed that that's not the case, that all Datoga are located within Tanzania. Uh, after migrating to Tanzania, the, the Datoga then split and migrated in a number of different directions. They're now kind of geographically dispersed uh, throughout Tanzania and not just northern central Tanzania. So here you can see a map from Tomikawa in 1970. Uh, this is showing the distribution of the Datoga uh, at the time of this publication. Uh, so you can see here in the north, uh, there are some, at the time, there were Datoga speakers north of the Serengeti um, near the Grumeti River. Then there were Datoga speakers surrounding Lake Ayasi in the Ayasi Basin. There were groups of Datoga in the Mbulu Highlands, as well as um, northwest of Singida and down south here near Itigi. Now here's a, a more recent language map. This is from Ethnologue. Um, it's 
uh, copyright is 2019, but I don't actually know the last time that this language map was updated, um, but probably sometime within in the past decade. Uh, so on this map, Datoga is labeled number 20. So you can see a similar distribution here. Um, there's a group here uh, surrounding Itigi. There's another group up here northwest of Singida. Um, and then there are speakers in the Mugu Highlands and also near the Gayasi and a small group of speakers north of the Serengeti. So this looks like uh, generally the same situation that was reported uh, by Tomikawa. So on a couple of occasions, I've actually uh, heard uh, some reports of Datoga residing in areas that weren't represented on any language map. So on the first occasion, I was, um, I was visiting Itigi to, to visit some Bianjita speakers there. And I heard from them that there are actually additional Bianjita speakers uh, north of Mbeya. So surprising to me because I'd never seen this on any map. Uh, I didn't know that there were any Datoga speakers in that area. Uh, on this map, in fact, that is represented. And this is a map from Joshua Project, which is uh, a missionary organization of some kind. Uh, so you can see there are two small spots here, kind of uh, northeast and northwest of Mbeya. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, those the Togo communities are not represented on, on any language map. Um, on a second occasion, I was watching the evening news. I was watching uh, ITV, which is the national, uh, national news channel in Tanzania. And uh, there was a news segment about Barabaya cattle herders in Bagamoyo district on the coast. So that would be over here north of Dar es Salaam. This also surprised me because I had never heard of Datoga living on the coast. Um, and when I wanted to, to look into this more, I actually found a wildlife management report that described uh, a group of bar bike herders uh, grazing their livestock in this same region. So they were uh, within this Wamambiki wildlife management area, which includes uh, three different districts, and one of those is Bagamoyo district on the coast. So again, that is um, here within the Pwani region, north of Dar es Salaam. So again, this is uh, not represented on any map that I've seen showing the distribution of the Datoga. So this is, uh, what this indicates is that because the Datoga are so widely dispersed throughout the country and because uh, they're traditionally semi-nomadic and, and some Datoga communities continue uh, to, to migrate fairly frequently, we don't actually know where all of the speakers are. And um, that's potentially problematic um, because that means that uh, we, we don't fully understand the extent to which uh, the Tatoga communities might vary linguistically and also uh, what sort of language context they might be uh, residing in. Okay, moving on to the second issue of the kind of the relationship between geographic and ethnic communities and language communities. Uh, this is a very interesting issue and this ties into a sort of uh, emic uh, ethnic subcategorization among the Datoga. There are these uh, ethnic subgroups called Emojiga, and Tomikawa claims that these Emojiga, they developed out of uh, historical socio-political grouping and then subsequent migration. So there was some sort of grouping when all of the Datoga were together in Kenya or perhaps in Northern Tanzania, um, and then they divided and migrated to uh, various parts of the country. And these Emojiga are kind of large subgroups within the Datoga. Um, they're larger than the, the clan level, uh, but they're also independent of clans. So as you can see in this quote from Tomikawa, uh, there's a general tendency for certain clans to correspond to certain Emojiga, but uh, there are also some uh, descent groups or some clans that are scattered among different Emojiga. So they, they aren't necessarily connected. Um, Tomokawa is also called Emojiga locality groups, and that's primarily on the basis of, uh, based on the fact that uh, most members of uh, these Emojiga, they live in the same region of Tanzania. And that's represented in the language maps. So you can see uh, Tomokawa in 1979, this is not a language map, but a map of the Emojiga. Um, and you can see here uh, each numbered area has one or two Emojiga represented. 
um, the names of the Emojiga are here at the bottom of the map, and then each area up here is assigned a number. So you can see in the north, we have Rotigenga and the Asimjiga, or Ishimjiga. Uh, then we have the Bajuta here south of Lake Ayasi, and the Buradiga to the west. Then Gisimjanga near Domovesh. Then down here, we have the Bardabaiga near Mount Hanang. To the west, we have Bajuta and Buradiga. And then to the south is Bianjida. There's a similar map in Rotland's 1982 book about the Southern Nilotic languages. Uh, this shows a, a roughly comparable distribution with some slight adjustments. Um, so the, the main difference uh, that, that I'm familiar with is that here near Lake Ayasi, uh, he actually labels this number two as including Bajuta and uh, Asimjaga or Isimjaga. So that indicating that there are Isimjaga near Lake Ayasi and then also north of the Serengeti. So the literature on the Emojiga is, is quite interesting and the relationship uh, between the Emojiga and the kind of um, purported uh, language groups is uh, directly connected to the anthropological literature. So Paul Berger in 1938, he published a report about an expedition that he conducted or participated in uh, from 1934 to 1936 in East Africa. And he made a number of recordings, and those recordings were actually later used by Roland Kiesling. And as far as I can tell, this, uh, this report is the first mention of the Emojiga subgroups. So he mentions at least the Barabaga and the Gisimjanga, and then um, also the Bianjida. Uh, Wilson in 1952 and 1953 uh, then provided kind of uh, further elaboration on these Emojiga subgroups including their geographic distribution, as well as their historical migration uh, from originally from Kenya, and then their kind of dispersal throughout Tanzania. And then T Tomikawa kind of additionally elaborated on these descriptions of the Emojiga uh, and their distribution throughout Tanzania. So Rotland in 1982, he provided the first linguistic description of uh, the speech varieties spoken by members of these different Emojiga. So we wanna take kind of a closer look at that. So uh, this, is the, um, this is the chart of Proto-Emotic de Toga from Rotland 1982. Uh, so this is showing uh, the kind of internal structure or relationships of the de Toga varieties as described by Rotland. Uh, but the first thing that I wanna point out is that uh, these distinct varieties that he has labeled here as D1, D2, all the way through D6, um, those are essentially the names of the Emojiga that were described in the anthropological literature. And at the beginning of the book, he says that he was operating under the assumption that the group names or the, the names of the Emojiga were given units. And then he sought out uh, at least two speakers for uh, each of those uh, Emojiga. So uh, you can see here that he has uh, seven in total, Bajuta, Gisimjanga, Bharabaiga, Isimjiga, Rutiganga, Bharabdiga, and Bianjida. Um, one, one distinction that he makes here is between Eastern and Western varieties. And then also for Gisimjanga and Bharabaiga, he gives them similar to labels. So he, he labels Gisimjanga as D2A and Barabaga as D2B. And I wanna talk about these divisions just briefly. So first, the distinction between East and West. Uh, well, within Rotland 1982, uh, the only information that he provides about this contrast between the Eastern and Western branch are these two sound correspondences. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, the Eastern languages, where they have just a, a ba and da consonants. Uh, the Western languages, they have uh, two contrasting sounds uh, for each of those uh, uh, consonants in the Eastern languages. So for ba, you might have a voiceless fricative or you might have the, the voice stop. For da, you either have the same consonant or you could have a rhotic. So uh, this sound correspondence was kind of the primary, uh, the primary distinguishing factor for making this branching between East and West. So I can provide just an example or a couple of examples from Rotland's unpublished uh, Datoga Dictionary. So here we can see the word child and children um, in Isimjega and Rotigenga. 
So in Isim Jega, you can see here on the right, there's a voice by labial stop, whereas in Rotigenga, there's a voiceless fricative. So again, that corresponds to the Eastern varieties and the Western varieties, as described by Rotland. Um, in the plural forms, uh, the word for children in Isim Jega, it has a voiced alveolar stop at the beginning, whereas in Rotigenga, there's a rhotic. So again, that corresponds to the other sound correspondence described by Rotland. Um, well, this is interesting because uh, from my own data that I've collected on Asim Jiga Toga, I actually see a mixture of these two patterns. So in the data that I've collected, um, the singular form for the word child, it actually has the voiceless uh, fricative. So it's jaft instead of something like jipped. Uh, but in the plural, there is not a rhotic, there's an alveolar stop. So it actually displays one of the sound correspondences, but not the other. So this raises the possibility that this division between East and West is somewhat problematic. Um, but also in general, this contrast between East and West uh, has not been discussed very much in the literature. And we actually don't really know very much about the relationships between the various Datoga varieties. We don't know uh, which varieties are more similar to each other and which are different. And, how exactly they came to be the way that they are today. Then just briefly, in uh, focusing on Gisamjanga and Barabaiga, um, the justification for labeling them both as D2, one as, as 2A and one as 2B, uh, this is described at the beginning of Rotland's book. So he says that um, the data that he, he presents in the book um, labeled as D2, it, uh, the data is representative of the speech used by both of these groups. Uh, he says, however, this doesn't exclude that there are dialectal differences between the two varieties. Um, so fortunately, uh, we've never seen any evidence of differences between the varieties. So we don't know how different or how similar they are. Uh, if there are differences, we don't know what those are. So we don't actually know if these are distinct varieties um, and, in terms of linguistic varieties um, rather than uh, distinct uh, ethnic groupings. Uh, so this kind of continues to be a problem in terms of the analysis of the Toga varieties, this distinction between language group and ethnic group. So just to make matters even more complicated, uh, later in 1997, a number of linguists associated with SIL conducted a dialect survey so they went out and visited members of a variety of different communities and they interviewed them and uh, they collected uh, word lists and they even did a perception task where they, they played a recording of a story uh, spoken by a Barabaga speaker and then they asked their interviewees to tell them uh, what they, how much they could understand and uh, what they thought about the speaker, where did the speaker come from, things like that. So, um, they produced some interesting findings. The report, or at least the copy of the report that I have is not complete, uh, but what is in there is quite interesting. So the first thing that I wanna point out is that they draw a distinction between uh, main Datoga dialect groups, so that what they identify as actual linguistic groups or language communities, and then these so-called specialized groups. So these they claimed are sort of like ethnic groups uh, that are interspersed among the other dialect groups and they tend to just adopt the, the language variety that is used by the people that they're residing with. Then they also mentioned some other groups, uh, those listed here at the bottom. Uh, the Sala Guajega um, were also described uh, in Wilson and Tomikawa's publications. Um, it, it's generally believed that the Sala Guajega uh, did speak a distinct variety of Datoga, but now they've uh, essentially merged in together with uh, neighboring Bantu groups. But one, uh, one interesting thing I want to point out right away is that uh, the Bajuta which, uh, were treated by Rotland uh, as uh, speaking a distinct variety of Datoga. Um, they're considered just to be a specialized group in this SIL dialect survey. And uh, in the description of their, um, of the interview responses that they received when they were conducting their sociolinguistic interviews, uh, 
a number of speakers claimed that the Bajuta did, uh, did not speak differently um, from anyone else, but that they would just adopt the speech of those that they were living with. So that sounds exactly like the definition um, they given for specialized groups. Uh, so that's interesting because um, on the one hand, we have sort of uh, a report that Baduta is a distinct variety. And then on the other hand, we have a report that it's not a distinct variety. And um, th this issue hasn't really ever been addressed. So we don't actually know if Baduta is a variety or not. Uh, but we do know that there are people who identify as Bajuta, but um, nobody has actually followed up on, on this particular issue. Um, in contrast to Bajuta, uh, the Gidang Odiga uh, were often described as being a sort of a specialized uh, subgroup of blacksmiths. So that's how they're described in uh, Tomikawa's publications, for example. Uh, but in the second half of the dialect survey, uh, the, the SIO linguists actually visited some Gidang Odiga and um, conducted interviews with them and collected word lists and, and did the perception task and actually included them in their analysis, their quantitative analysis here on the right, uh, which sort of indicates that uh, they perceive the Gidang Odiga as um, as using a distinct language variety that was uh, unique and different from the other varieties. So this would uh, support the claim that Gidang Odiga is actually a main dialect group rather than a specialized group, but uh, this distinction wasn't really addressed in the SIL survey. Um, so that's, that's sort of another interesting finding from that survey. Uh, just briefly on the right, uh, this uh, quantitative analysis was based on the word list that they collected. Uh, and this is very telling. You can see that some of the varieties appear to be very similar to each other, uh, whereas some of the other varieties are more distinct. Um, so on the top, you can see that Gisimjanga is essentially 95% similar to Bartabaiga, uh, whereas down at the bottom, Bianjida is 71% similar to Bartabaiga. Uh, the exact methodology that they used in determining or, or uh, calculating these percentages um, isn't detailed on the survey, uh, but it's uh, definitely an interesting finding. Uh, one other thing that I want to point out is that in terms of the literature on Datoga varieties, uh, there's a very strong focus, uh, especially on Gisimjanga and Parabaiga. Uh, so you can see on the left, uh, there are a number of recording, or a number of publications that focus either just on Gisimjanga or Gisimjanga and one other variety. And also, I would add that uh, within the literature that describes multiple varieties, oftentimes there's uh, somewhat of a, a stronger representation of Gisimjanga and Bartabaga compared to the other varieties. Um, on the other hand, in terms of publications focusing on a, a Datoka variety that is not either Gisimjanga or Barabaga. As far as I know, there's only one, and that is uh, Hieda 2000, which is a description of some patterns in, um, related to the voicing of stop consonants in Bojuta Datoga. Uh, I've been working on Asimjig Datoga. Uh, my uh, publications aren't out yet, um, so they're still in progress. Uh, but basically, there, there's nothing, if we go back to this list of main dialect groups, there's nothing that has been written on Bianjida, there's nothing written on Boradega or Rotigenga. Uh, so there's kind of uh, a lot of work left to be done. And if anyone is interested in uh, working on Datoga, I would strongly recommend uh, that they take a look at, especially Bianjida, uh, because it's certainly endangered and, and appears to be very distinct from all of the other varieties. Okay, so as I said, um, I've been doing some field work uh, for the past four years, uh, working with Asim Jake Datoga communities, uh, first funded by the Indigenous Languages Documentation Program, and then also by the uh, Firebird Foundation for Anthropological Research. And uh, I became interested in Asim Jake Datoga for a number of reasons. Uh, probably the main reason was that it was described as one of the most distinct varieties of the Togo is also described as uh, an endangered variety. Uh, 
Um, also, there were reports in the anthropological literature claiming that the SMJ did not constitute uh, a valid uh, ethnic subgroup, but rather that they, uh, they came from a, a different tribe entirely and had somehow joined the Datoga and, and became an ethnic group um, among the Datoga, but that their origins were not um, in the Datoga. So some basic questions that I wanted to answer. Uh, do the SMJ Datoga, do they speak differently? And if so, in what ways? Uh, also, how many speakers are there? Where are they located? And then I wanted to answer this question. Do the SMJ come from another tribe originally or are they Datogan? So first, just answering the question about some differences. Uh, I don't have time to go through all these differences. And the, this is a non-exhaustive list that I just kind of put together fairly quickly. Uh, but there are very many differences between SMJ Datoga and the patterns that have been described for other varieties. Uh, some of them are, are somewhat trivial. Um, so there might be a phenomenon that just has a slightly different distribution in SMJ Datoga, uh, but some of them are actually somewhat significant. Um, so for example, uh, tonal case, uh, the tonal case patterns are are quite distinct in SMJ Datoga, and I'm actually working on a, a publication describing those patterns. Uh, also the shadow vowels, uh, these kind of uh, word final voiceless vowels on nominals that have been described for all other varieties of Datoga, those simply don't exist in the citation forms in SMJ Datoga, uh, but they actually emerge as, as full vowels, as they're not voiceless, um, but uh, fully realized vowels in nonverbal predicate constructions. So that's interesting. Um, there's a whole number of, uh, of other differences that uh, include phonetics of phonology, morphology, syntax, um, basically every domain you can think of. Uh, so there certainly are differences between SMJ Datoga and the other varieties of Datoga. Uh, and I don't think in the literature that these differences have been highlighted. There's kind of been more of a focus on describing the similarities between the varieties rather than the differences. So in terms of the number of speakers uh, and the origins of the SMJ, well, um, as far as I can tell, according to the oral history that I've collected, there's, there's no evidence, um, at least within that oral history, that the SMJ come from a different tribe. I've never heard a single story about that um, from any of the elders that I've spoken with. So I'm not sure where that story came from. Um, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's unclear from the anthropological literature uh, what sort of inf uh, speakers Tomikawa was, was working with, for example, or, or Wilson was working with. Were they uh, interviewing uh, SMJ speakers or were they working with bar bike speakers? It's, it's unclear, but I haven't found any evidence to show that, that they actually come from a different tribe. Uh, in terms of the number of speakers and where they're located, uh, I estimate there are approximately 3,000 speakers and they live in uh, four communities. Now, two of these communities were already known. So the first one, Mangola, uh, was described um, as early as uh, 1952 in, in Wilson's first report. Um, or sorry, excuse me, that, that was actually not until uh, Rotland. Um, so Mangola was described first in, in uh, Rutland's 1982 book about the Southern Nilotic languages, but the the fourth community listed here, Lao in the Senye district, that was described uh, first in 1952 by Wilson. Uh, so it's been known for a long time that the SMJ have been residing in those two areas, but the middle two communities here, Matala and Mohosht, uh, those were essentially unknown uh, to linguists until I started conducting my field work. So uh, what I want to do now, is because I've already kind of pointed out some of the differences between uh, some Jake de Toga as sort of a, an ethnolect compared to these other varieties that have been described, I also want to highlight some of the specific differences between these four communities, because I, th I believe that this represents sort of a another uh, dimension of variation that really has not received much attention within the uh, uh, domain of uh, Datoga linguistics. So I want to talk briefly about these four communities and share a little bit about the uh, differences in terms of the sociolinguistic context of each community. 
So here first is a map of the four communities. So this is showing the entire uh, region of East Africa and where the four communities are located. And then here's sort of a zoomed in map showing the four communities. Uh, so again, here at the top, we have Lao, or it's labeled as Isenye, which is the name of the district. Um, and then down here, we have these three communities in the Ayasi Basin. There's Mamola, and Dugumohosht, and Matala. Uh, so I'm first gonna start uh, with Mangola. So uh, Mangola, in Mangola, the SMJ primarily live in uh, three villages. Mangola is actually a collection of the villages. Uh, these three villages where the Asim Jager living are on the western border. So uh, they're actually kind of um, right next to the, the area that's most sparsely populated. So the total number of Asim Jager Toga living in these villages is estimated to be between 400 and 600. And uh, again, most of them are on the western edge of the, the hills of Lakangarari. So you can see these hills here. So the three villages are Malek Chan, Lakhangarari, and Dumbe Chan. You can see there, there are uh, the hills of Lakhangarari here, there's the hill of Barazani, and then there's a valley here in the middle. In the valley, um, it's not really a residential area that's primarily used for agriculture. But on the other side of the valley, there are, um, there are some villages kind of behind the edge of these southern hills. Uh, but for the SMJ de Toga, they primarily live in these three villages on the west. Uh, Mangola is the most urban and cosmopolitan of the four SMJ de Toga communities. And the residential patterns, um, they kind of situate the homes very closely together, separated from the agricultural fields. So here you can see a satellite image of the center of the Hangarari village. And you can see that there are a lot of homes kind of tightly packed together here. And then uh, in the valley, there are no homes at all. Uh, there are these agricultural fields. And from a perspective of uh, the Toga research, this is somewhat interesting because this does not resemble the traditional uh, residential pattern of the Toga communities at all. Um, the kind of uh, stereotypical uh, Datoga home consists of a, a boma of some sort uh, with some grazing land, um, not these kind of uh, closely packed homes with uh, corrugated uh, metal roofing. So this is kind of a very modern residential pattern um, and it kind of supports uh, this uh, agricultural work um, within the valley. Uh, other ethnic groups in the area that include non Asim Jake Toga, so especially uh, Bojuta and then also um, uh, Barnabaiga. There's also a lot of Iraq speakers. Uh, so even in Lakhangarari, for example, it's quite interesting that uh, most of the Iraq, they live on the eastern side of the village. And then the Asim Jig, they live on the western side. And in the middle, they kind of mix. Uh, there are also Hadzabe in Mangola, and there are Bantu groups that have immigrated from the west, including Sukuma, Niramba, and Sanzu. And uh, Swahili is widely spoken throughout uh, Mangola, and is actually very rare to find a monolingual Asimjik to Toga speaker. Also, many Asimjik can speak Iraq in this area uh, due to intermarriage and general language contact. So here's just another image showing uh, the kind of residential patterns that we find in Mangola. So you'll see uh, some somewhat traditional uh, housing structures with thatched roofing, and then you'll see some very modern structures. This painted house is actually the one that I lived in. It's one of the nicest houses in the village. Um, but you can see that uh, people do still keep uh, livestock um, in addition to um, farming their fields in the valley. Also Mangola, just as a side note, is well known for the irrigation systems that they use there uh, because there are a number of springs in the valley they're able to farm throughout the year. And that's one reason that uh, there are a number of uh, uh, Bantu speakers from neighboring areas because they've dr been drawn to the region uh, because of this agricultural work. Okay, so now we're going to move from Mangola to Matala. And I wanna point out right now that uh, these three communities in the Lake Ayasi Basin, they are somewhat close to each other, but they are all kind of on the edge of this sparsely inhabited area 
which is traditional homeland of the uh, Hadzabe. And uh, there are no roads going through this area. So if you want to get from Mangola to Matala, you either you know, uh, take a piki piki through the bush or you take um, the Daladala buses f uh, from Mangola to Karatu to Mbulu to Haidam and then to Matala. So you basically have to circumnavigate, circum circumnavigate this uh, bushland in the middle. And the same is true for getting to Dulin Post. Okay, so Matala is located near the southwestern tip of Lake Yassi, and it's um, it's kind of, uh, it's interesting how, how the residential patterns are in Matala because central Matala is uh, very dense, uh, but the surrounding areas are very sparse. You can see here's a picture of uh, some young boys uh, walking towards Matala. And on the left and the right, you can see there are not many housing structures, but then as you get closer, uh, the structures are very kind of densely packed in together. Um, so although uh, what you see here does not look very traditional, once you leave the center of Matala, there are actually very kind of uh, traditional uh, homesteads. So other ethnic groups in Matala include uh, Nanasimjig de Toga, especially Bartabaiga. Uh, there's also a lot of Sukuma, Isanzu, and Yudamba speakers. Um, and I believe this is less due to, due to immigration because of agricultural activities because Matala is not an agricultural center in the same way that Mangola is, but more just due to the fact that Matala is closer to the traditional homelands uh, of these uh, Bantu groups. Um, one interesting thing is that some of the Sukuma men and women in the area adopted toga style clothing. So um, in Matala, this consists of uh, a black shuka um, on the upper torso and then also metal bangles on the wrists and ankles. So this is interesting because it indicates uh, a level of local prestige associated with the datoga. Uh, also, many of the SMJ datoga in the area wear this completely black shawl, uh, which is a practice that's not as common in Mongolia. Uh, that's not represented in the image here. You can see on the right uh, that uh, the, the SMJ datoga and the, the picture on the right are wearing uh, these uh, shawl patterns that are associated with datoga just kind of generally. The number of Asim J. Datoga speakers in Matala is estimated to be no more than 600. So roughly comparable to the number of speakers in Mangola. Okay, then moving on to the third Lake Ayasi community, or Ayasi Basin community, Dugumohosht. So Dugumohosht is the most remote Asim J. Datoga community. It's located in the Eshkesh district of the Mbulu region, and it's separated from Lake Ayasi by a range of hills. Uh, Dugumahosh consists of perhaps three dozen or so traditional homesteads and some small farm plots. And the only other ethnic groups in the area are non Asamjig, Datoga, and a small number of Hadzabe. So most of the Asamjig speakers in this region um, or this community, they do not know any other indigenous languages of Tanzania other than uh, perhaps uh, Barabaga Datoga. And that's because um, most likely because uh, their exposure to other indigenous groups consists of just exposure to other Datoga groups. Uh, the number of speakers in this area is estimated to be no more than 200. So there are not very many speakers, uh, but this is also the area in which um, I believe that ASMJ Datoga is the least endangered. Uh, you can see here in the image on the top right, uh, they're constructing uh, a a, a new housing structure with corrugated metal roofing. This was significant because uh, this was in 2017 when they were building this structure. This was actually the first structure in the area with the corrugated metal roofing. Uh, so that was kind of a, a signal to everyone that they were kind of starting to develop. Okay, now we're going to move to the fourth and final community, which is north of the Serengeti. Uh, again, this is called Lao or Isenye. And Lao is a generic term uh, used for all of the SMJ Datoga communities in the Mara region. Uh, most of them are in the Isenye ward of the Serengeti district. And Lao is of great cultural significance to the SMJ Datoga because it's their claim place of origin. Uh, however, language use has declined significantly in the area. Uh, 
the largest community of Assam Jigdo Toho speakers is in a village called Manawa, which is 10 kilometers northeast of Isenyu village. Uh, one thing I just want to share, you can see in this image on the top left, uh, the only way to get to Lao, if we go back to our map, uh, the only way to get to Lao from the Ayasi Basin communities without paying the fees for going through all of these parks is you actually have to circumnavigate the parks. So that means that you have to uh, cross the Sibiti River. And the only way to do that is in a dugout canoe like this. So it's always my favorite part of that trip. <laughs> so um, in the picture on the top right, you can see the center of Manawa village. Uh, there's very little known about the linguistic status of the Toga varieties in this area. Uh, I can confirm that there are Asim Jake speakers, uh, most likely no more than 200. Uh, there are, are also Rotigenga speakers. Uh, it's also safe to say that the speech patterns used in Lao are considered to be uh, distinct from those of the other communities. So I know this just from uh, interviewing uh, speakers of Asim Jake to Toga from AASI communities. Um, the Assam Jig de Toga of Lao are also culturally distinct in a number of ways. Uh, the men do not wear uh, the, the shuka at all. And this can be kind of surprising for someone who has worked with pastoralists in central Tanzania uh, to find a toga who simply just do not wear any traditional clothing at all. Um, also, their uh, song and dance traditions indicate significant influence from neighboring Bantu groups, including the Senye and the uh, Korea. So briefly, just uh, uh, I want to mention that the relationships between these communities also is connected to uh, the amount of language contact um, and the uh, level of distinction between the speech varieties used by members of each community. So as you can tell just by looking at the map, uh, Lao, or here labeled Isenye, is uh, quite separate from uh, the three southern communities. And that is represented in the, uh, the speech of that community. Uh, so the speech in Lao, as I said, um, is considered to be distinct from those of the other communities, uh, whereas those in the South are kind of roughly comparable, although each community uh, does kind of have its own distinct features. Uh, so the members of the three Southern communities, uh, they can easily travel from one community to the other. Also, it's very common for uh, members of one community to have relatives residing in another community. So um, uh, one, of, one of the members of the Mongol community that I worked with for, for many years, um, his mother lives in Dugumahosht, so he would very regularly travel to Dugumahosht to visit her. Uh, also, I know of one woman who lived in Mongol who then moved to Matala. And you can make these trips by foot. It usually takes either one very long day or two days. Um, so people are actually kind of uh, migrating among these three different communities, this sort of a network of communities. Whereas to get to Lao, north of the Serengeti, it's very expensive. So it's uh, much less common for members of the southern communities to travel to the north or for members of the northern community to travel to the south. Okay, I briefly want to mention some other types of variation that I haven't really discussed today. Um, Alice Mitchell, another RVN member, uh, has done a great job at expanding the domain of Totoga linguistics to include things uh, like anthropological linguistics, uh, especially with a focus on avoidance speech and kind of gender lectal uh, variation. So she's published um, at least three times specifically on this topic. Um, and it's, uh, I think, quite an interesting uh, topic for Totoka linguistics. Um, if you're not familiar with avoidance speech, uh, the basic concept is that um, uh, female speakers will avoid uh, certain words or sounds uh, or constructions that somehow uh, resemble uh, the name or names of relatives, uh, specifically in-laws. And that uh, over time, this is uh, in some cases actually created sort of uh, gender like or gender like varieties, such that uh, women will use a certain set of, uh, of words, whereas men will use a different set of words to refer to essentially the same thing. Uh, there has been uh, no work, as far as I'm aware, done 
on sociolex or hlex or style and register among the datoga. So those are also different types of variation that we could continue to follow up on. Uh, finally, I just want to share some Datoga uh, resources for those who are interested in, in working on Datoga linguistics. So the first is just a Datoga bibliography. This is part of a, a larger Rift Valley bibliography that uh, some other Rift Valley Network members and I are working together on. Uh, but I thought I would just provide this now um, if anyone is interested in looking at the literature. Uh, so if you uh, go to this URL, if you enter that into your web browser, uh, then that should take you to a Dropbox folder. And in that folder, uh, there is a text bibliography together with some PDFs. And then there's also a .bib file, which can be used to uh, import the bibliography into a reference manager like Zotero or Mendeley. Uh, also, I just want to share uh, some resources that I've been working on myself. Um, so uh, all of the data that I collected as a part of the Indigenous Languages Documentation Program project that, that I conducted for three years, those are uh, all archived at the Indigenous Languages Archive called ELAR. The deposit is called Documentation of Isimjega de Toga, and you can access it using this URL here. Uh, it's a very large deposit. There's, um, I believe, something like 140 hours of audiovisual material uh, from over 60 different speakers, uh, covering a wide variety of different speech genres. Uh, so if you're interested in any of those materials, you're welcome to visit the collection. And uh, it's all unrestricted access, uh, so you can download uh, any of the files. I'm also working on uh, what I'm calling the open corpus of Awesome Jake de Toga. And you might be wondering, well, what's the difference between the archive and the corpus? Well, the archive is designed um, for the long-term preservation of the data, but also to satisfy the needs of various different user groups, including community member users, as well as uh, researcher users who uh, might not be linguists. So uh, anthropologists, for example, or maybe ethnomusicologists. Uh, the corpus, however, uh, I'm hoping to design it specifically just for linguists. So the idea is to make a resource that is useful for anyone who wants to study some sort of linguistic phenomenon, uh, using the Asimj awesome Toga data that I've collected. Uh, it's still very much in progress, so you're welcome to visit, but the, there's not much there right now. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, working on that project with me, um, please let me know, and I'd be happy to collaborate. All right, well, I think that's all that I have for today. So uh, thank you for listening. I will now check the chat box to see if there are any questions. All right, we have one question from Andrew Harvey. How long has the separation been between Lao and the Southern communities? Do you think that it has only been since the creation of the game parts, or is this something longer, more extensive? Uh, that's a great question. And um, yeah, I did actually have a slide about this that I, I took out uh, for the sake of time. Uh, so there's actually a very interesting migration history uh, associated with the SMJ and the Bajuta. And this is described in, I don't know if I have the year right, but I believe it's Tomikawa 1979. Um, so he describes um, the oral history of the uh, Bajuta uh, traveling first from Ngorongoro Crater, uh, south to Kurus, and then west, um, I think northwest of Singida, uh, and then all the way north, um, north of the Serengeti. Um, supposedly, the SMJ were residing uh, north of the Serengeti, even when the Bajuta were in Ngorongoro Crater. But when the Bajuta came, uh, came north and joined them there, uh, north of the Serengeti, um, my understanding is that the, the, the SMJ uh, essentially were subservient to the Bajuta. So they, they functioned as a sort of a, a slave clan of sorts. And in fact, um, Many Assam Jake speakers have told me that the the uh, history of the the name uh, Assam Jake or Assam Jan actually originally meant slave. So the Assam Jake were essentially enslaved by the Bajuta, at least according to the oral history. And this well-known figure uh, Sagilo, um, he essentially commanded them uh, to follow him as he migrated south again uh, from Lao going down to the Yasi Basin and over to Dongo Besh. So um, the timing of that, 
I believe, according to Tomikawa, uh, he claims that um, that that original that initial migration from Lao down to the Yasi Basin, together with Saigilo, that that would have occurred sometime in the 19th century. Um, I can't verify that, uh, but I I do know that in terms of uh, communities migrating uh, specifically to Mangola and Matala and Dugmohosht, that definitely occurred during the 20th century. So my understanding is that the uh, most of the Asamjig were migrating together with the Bajuta at some point in the 19th century, then they separated from the Bajuta at some point in the 20th century and uh, migrated to those, um, those three southern communities in the Yasi Basin. Uh, what's interesting, however, is that according to the oral history, some of the Asamjig remained in the north um, and did not accompany Saigilo during this great migration south, uh, whereas some, some of the Asamjig who migrated south then later returned north. So you have sort of a mixture, kind of a layering of different historical migrations. So uh, in, in terms of the historical separation between these communities, in one sense, it's uh, the separation has been for perhaps over a hundred years, uh, but in another sense, people have been kind of migrating back and forth between these communities during that period. Okay, we have got a second question from Andrew Harvey. Or no, wait, we've got multiple questions. Sorry, guys, let me go through each one. Okay, Bonnie Sands has a question. Do you have recordings where people discuss the experience of being enslaved, and do you think of any possible linguistic effects of enslavement, and or what allow them to escape that status? Now, that's a very good question. I don't have any recordings specifically of uh, discussions of enslavement. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have too much information about that, uh, at least currently. So that's something that um, I could look into in the future. Uh, in terms of escaping that status, I also don't have too much information about that. Uh, my impression is that it's, it's somehow connected to perhaps colonialism, because uh, after the migration south, together with Saigilo and the Bajuta, uh, then uh, German control ended and uh, British control uh, essentially began. And um, a, a number of leaders among the Bajuta uh, were executed. So that might have had some impact on the social structure and might have given the Asamjig some sort of opening to kind of move out on their own. But the specifics of that kind of enslavement relationship between the Asamjig and the Bajuta, I still don't have too much information about that. And it's something that uh, I could look into further. Okay, uh, Andrew Harvey uh, has a question. Based on your experience, do you have any thoughts on further documentation of the toga? Any approaches, methodologies, geographic areas, thematic threads that would be fruitful or interesting to follow in the future? Uh, certainly, I think uh, it would be very worthwhile uh, to get further documentation of the Anjida de Toga, uh, as spoken in Itigi, and then also uh, north of Mbea. Uh, Bianjida de Toga is reported to be uh, one of the most distinct varieties of de Toga, and it's also one of the most endangered varieties. And in fact, when I went to Itigi, it wasn't even clear if there were going to be speakers. Uh, when I went there, uh, the only the only speakers who were still fluent were elders. Um, there was interest among some of the youth in setting up a, a language school of some kind, uh, but none of the youth that I met in, in Itigi proper uh, could speak the Anjuda de Toga. Uh, the, the speakers that I, I, I talked to did claim that there were more rural communities kind of outside of Itigi village, um, where we might still find uh, younger speakers today, but I wasn't able to verify that. But certainly in terms of uh, varieties, I would strongly encourage anyone who's interested in working on the toga to look at Bianjida de Toga. Uh, in terms of methodology, certainly I think it would be very fruitful to start to look at all of the variations uh, that we find across these uh, different de Toga communities. Uh, so across the different uh, Mojiga, then also in terms of the different uh, geographic regions. Um, so just looking at Barabike, for example, there's been a lot of work done in the Mbula Highlands, but 
as far as I know, no one has gone to visit the Barbaika near Morogoro or in Bagamoyo district. Um, I don't know if, um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say if, uh, if the speech varieties um, used by those communities are representative of those in the Mbubu Highlands or if there's some uh, differences there. Uh, but I definitely think that's something we could follow up on. Okay, Martin Mouse has some questions uh, or comments. Says the enslavement was probably more like a Doroba relationship. And that's true, I agree with that. Uh, so there have been a number of claims uh, in the anthropological literature that uh, the Asimjig uh, did not herd cattle. And it is, uh, um, I would agree that in my experience, uh, the Asimjig have claimed to uh, historically kind of have a mixture of different lifestyle practices. So they were not just herding livestock, but they were also hunting. They might have also been farming a little bit. So they're really kind of uh, mixing these different uh, lifestyles in a way that is not really typically associated with the toga um, proper. Uh, so he also adds, Saigudo was just before German entry into the area. His son was hanged. All peoples in the wider area have stories about him. Safari Sanka started writing a thesis bibliography about Saigudo, but passed away too early. Yes, so Saigilo is a very well-known figure throughout the region. Um, so he was just before German entry into the area. Yes, so, um, uh, okay, there's a new question. I'll, I'll answer or address this comment first. So um, my understanding is that when the, uh, when the uh, leaders of the Bajuta were uh, were uh, executed. Uh, that was after Sagilo's time. So Sagilo passed away and then his descendants, uh, I don't recall the name of the per particular descendant, but he was uh, he was executed perhaps Martin Mouse knows. Uh, but yes, Sagilo is a very famous uh, figure within the region and um, it's in the Asimjig de Toga oral literature. Uh, he's described as a leader of the Bojuta and then also at that time, kind of a leader of the Asim Jig, although um, that was primarily because he displaced the former leader of the Asim Jig. So according to the oral literature, when they were living together in, in Lao, uh, north of the Serengeti, the uh, leader of the Asim Jig de Togo was called Ewanda or Ewan, and Saigulo um, essentially defeated him uh, through the use of magic and then kind of uh, took on the role of the, uh, the leader of the Asim Jig after defeating Iwanda. So uh, Martin Mouse also adds a, a question, do they eat fish in Lao? Do all Asim Jig eat fish traditionally? Um, in my experience, all, all Asim Jig uh, do eat fish. Um, they, it's not a, a uh, not a practice that is sort of central to their way of life, but it is something that they do. That is something that uh, was reported by uh, Tomikawa um, back in the 1970s. And that is something that does also distinguish them from other groups of Totogo who specifically do not eat fish. Okay, Bonnie Sands adds uh, that she knew a man named, uh, had a man named Saigilo and Andrew adds that one of the past chiefs of the Sansu was named Saigilo. So yeah, it's possible that there, um, there's overlap uh, between the oral histories of various groups in this region, not just the Toga groups, but um, also uh, Bantu groups and Cushitic groups and also the Hadza. Uh, I think Saigilo had a lot of influence on many of the indigenous communities in the region. And whether or not um, the Saigilo of the Sanzu was the same person, it, I, I don't know if that's clear, um, but Okay, Andrew says probably not, <laughs> but perhaps he was uh, named after the Saigilo of the, the Totoga. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining the talk today. I also want to uh, make a short announcement that in two weeks time, we will have a, another presentation on Totoga, this time from Alice Mitchell. And she will be focusing on the use of Swahili by Totoga children in a rural community in the uh, Eshkesh district of Mbulu region. Uh, so that again will be on a, on a Wednesday, two weeks from now uh, at the same time. 
So uh, thank you everyone and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.